Then I got a question that says, Tops, what is a pulse? And the question that I have from what is a pulse, um, I'm not sure who gave us this question, Bali, but when we talk about a pulse, I'm first going to give you the definition. Now, when we talk about pulses, pulses actually come in from grade 10. We do a little bit of them in grade 11, but then in grade 10, in grade 12, they pop up again in your final exam paper, where we talk about destructive and constructive interference. Now, if you're having a little bit of some issues with that, I would say go back to grade 9, learn about your pulses, and then you can take it back to grade 11 content and as well to grade uh, 12. Step number one, what is a pulse? And then I'm going to explain it. So when we look at a pulse, a pulse is a single disturbance it is a single disturbance that moves moves through a medium so a question like this they can ask you in multiple choice and so forth i always tell my my learners your definitions from grade 10 you're going to take with you. So when you think about a pulse, disturbance through a medium, a medium can either be water, a, a, a wooden floor, a solid floor, and stuff like that. If somebody was to jump on the floor and you feel that vibration, right? That is a pulse that's moving through. Think about when you go and watch the soccer and everyone is doing the Mexican wave, woo, everyone's doing the Mexican wave. The people technically don't move, but the wave actually moves. So the people are actually acting as a medium and the wave that is moving is actually the pulse that is moving. However, when we talk about pulses, there are two types, right? We, we get a transverse pulse, then we get a longitudinal pulse. Now here's the difference between the two. The first one, if I look at a transverse pulse, a transverse pulse and most of the time in grade 10 your teacher will use a slinky and she will show you how this moves it's a pulse that moves up and down it is perpendicular to the direction of motion and then remember when you have a transverse pulse this is now not drawn to scale but at the top part you've got your crest at the bottom part you've got your trough if you've got one full crest and one full trough we can say that is one wavelength the height from the starting position to this height here is what we call your amplitude, right? So it, this also works um, if you look at pulses, like especially for a transverse pulse, when you're looking at waves and stuff like that, we can also use it. Another one where you actually see the sine wave is when we work with motors and generators. I hope you guys can remember that. When we're looking at alternating current, we also work with graphs like this. So make sure that you can really see the trend that is actually common between the two. But this is the first one. This is a transverse pulse. When it moves, it moves perpendicular to the direction of motion. If the graph is moving this way, I always like writing a T there because it's almost like it's forming a little T there. The second type of pulse is a longitudinal pulse. Longitudinal. So if you were to take a slinky and um, most of the time your teacher will have a slinky with her and then you will move the slinky back and forth like this. So as you're moving the slinky back and forth, you're going to see compression and refraction. That is a longitudinal pulse. So it technically looks something like this. You're going to have Parts where they're really solid and then they move apart, then really solid, then they move apart, then really solid, and so forth. So here we are going to have compression, here is refraction, compression, refraction, and so forth. Here where we've got where we've got crests and troughs, we've got compression and refraction. And that's then how we find the um, the, the wavelength that we have. Now also remember, now in grade 10, this is what we learn and then we take it over to grade 12. But then again in grade 10, they also add constructive and destructive interference as well as superposition. So this happens, I'm gonna use the transverse pulse. If I look at this transverse pulse, and let's say I've got a pulse coming in this direction, and then I've got another pulse uh, coming in this direction, then obviously when they meet, it becomes really, really big and so forth. If I have another scenario, one is coming in this direction. Now remember, my drawings are drawn to scale. One is moving in that direction, then they are to cancel each other out. So that is then when you either get constructive interference and destructive interference. Because from this, in grade 10, they're going to give you, in grade 12, they're going to give you something like this. Let me just, uh, let me some more work here. They're going to tell you we have a single slit somewhere here or a double slit and so forth, then they're going to tell you we are forming wavelengths like this. And then the examiner is going to say, 
please tell me what is going on over there. Then you must either know whether it's constructive interference or destructive interference. The only way you can get to know it is when you go back to your grade 10, learn about your pulses and your waves, transverse and longitudinal waves, and then you can move over to grade, uh, to grade 11. And then in grade 12, you must learn about the single slit and the double slit, when does superposition takes, take place, and so forth. Another thing that the examiners like doing, they can either give you the drawing and then ask you or ask you to draw it. So make sure you don't cram the work, but you understand what is going on. Like I always say, if something does not make sense, draw a picture. Draw the two crests that are coming together or draw a crest and a trough that's coming in the opposite direction. And in your mind, you'll never forget that picture. It always works, trust me.